me. So I'm going to talk today about flexible biological propulsors at intermediate Reynolds numbers. So a little bit higher Reynolds number than um, our last talk, some really interesting stuff there. Um, we're going to talk about cilia a little bit, but not at all in the same way. I think that a lot of you are used to thinking about it. Um, and so uh, before I start, I'm just going to kind of introduce myself. Um, I'm at Penn State in the mechanical engineering department. I run the environmental and biological fluid mechanics lab. Uh, and I have a little bit of a weird disciplinary background. I started in mechanical and aerospace engineering as an undergraduate at Princeton uh, and got kind of bit by the biomechanics bug. My senior thesis was to build a robot manta ray, which was fun. Um, and uh, then I, I got kind of bait and switched into doing a PhD in civil engineering. Uh, and I actually did that in particle and turbulence. Um, so, so very high Reynolds numbers uh, at Berkeley. But while I was there, I got to take a summer course at the University of Washington, where I did a little bit of work on fish biomechanics. Um, and uh, if anybody has been out to Friday Harbor Labs, it's an absolutely fascinating, beautiful, um, wonderful, biodiverse place. Um, highly recommend a visit there. Um, and then I did a postdoc in ecology and evolutionary biology, where I continued putting animals into strange tanks uh, and looking at the intersection of behavior and fluids. Um, so that was at UC Irvine. Um, and then actually did all my experimental work uh, for my postdoc at the Monterey Aquarium. Uh, and that's where I really first got uh, interested in a group of animals called tenophores, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and so I live in State College, Pennsylvania, uh, which is kind of a fun place for me to live because it's where I was born and raised. I lived here until I was about 17 uh, and then said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to Penn State. You know, I'm going to blow this popsicle stand and, you know, life is kind of funny. Um, but the high school here is, uh, it's kind of insulting because the mascot is the little lions. So Penn State is the mitten lions and the high school is the little lions. Uh, and so if you're following along with that, that means from high school to undergraduate to graduate school, the mascots I had were lions and tigers and bears. Uh, and so my mom's got a lot of mileage out of that joke. Um, and just because, you know, science is made of humans and we're all whole people. Um, I do like to do stuff outside the lab, which me and my husband on a hike in Kauai. That was back when we still had hobbies. I don't have hobbies anymore because I have children. Uh, and so my, my children take up most of my time um, outside of work. So that's me um, and uh, in a nutshell. And you can look at the link to my lab website there for a little bit more about what we do. But I'm going to start with a pretty simple sort of uncontroversial premise, which is that if you want to swim or if you want to fly, you've got to move fluid somehow. Um, and there are a lot of ways to do this. We think about, um, you know, and as engineers, we often think about rigid linkages and dynamical systems and things like that. But a lot of biological organisms are very flexible uh, and deformable, like the ones you can see here. So how do we think about the way that these deformable animals move fluid? Well, we can use uh, computational techniques, of course, like the you know very elegant stuff that we saw in the last talk, but we can also use experimental techniques. Um, and this is a figure from one of the very first volumetric velocimetry uh, projects involving animals. This is Brooke Lang's, uh, I think her PhD work um, with George Lauder, uh, looking at the 3D flow structures that are being generated by these animals as they swim, flexible fins uh, and other body components. Um, but one interesting thing that I find about um, Walk, uh, swimming and flying as opposed to other walking, right, is your other kind of uh, mode of locomotion is that if you're walking, then it's pretty much the same deal, whether you're tiny or whether you're big, you're generating ground reaction forces and you're using them to propel yourself along the substrate. There's some complexity, you know, there's substrate is squishy or something like that, but, but you're generating ground reaction forces and whether you're tiny or whether you're huge. Um, but if you are swimming, then it kind of matters whether you are tiny or huge. Um, and my very favorite example of this is Roy Holzman and Victor China's paper, I think from 2014, where they looked at the feeding mechanisms of larval fish. So a lot of fish feed with suction feeding, right? They open the mouth, the buccal cavity creates a ne uh, negative pressure and the food zooms in, right? And that's how a lot of fish do their feeding. Uh, but a larval fish, because it's operating at such a low Reynolds number, uh, the flow is reversible. So it opens its mouth, the food goes in, and it closes its mouth and the food goes out. Uh, and, and this is one reason they were able to show why so few larval fish make it to adulthood. They called it hydrodynamic starvation. Uh, and so uh, it's a really interesting paper and I recommend it. Uh, but that's a, a great way to illustrate the importance of scale on a lot of uh, functional processes in animals. Um, and so coming back to this idea of low Reynolds number, this is, uh, uh, I believe it's E. coli, I'm sorry, the video is a little bit pixelated. Um, but you have 
uh, some differences here, right? You have a big um, mint array using a lift-based way of propulsion, very oscillatory, uh, whereas uh, something that swims with cilia or flagella, uh, the drag is, is operating and the viscous drag is much more dominant than the inertial forces on the flow. Um, and, and that makes this flow time reversible, right? Um, and we'll get a little bit more into this. Uh, but of course we quantify this with the Reynolds number. And I think most people will be familiar, but I'll do a quick overview. Reynolds number gives us the ratio between inertia and viscosity in a given situation, right? Um, where if you have an inertially dominated flow, really the key is you can glide, right? If you're swimming in a swimming pool full of water and you do your stroke, then you don't stop moving, right? You keep, you keep kind of gliding along on the power of that stroke. But if your swimming pool is filled with molasses or another high viscosity fluid, as soon as you stop pushing, then you stop moving, right? So the, the idea of gliding is kind of key when you think about Reynolds number and swimming. Low Reynolds number, can't glide. High Reynolds number, you can. Uh, and that leads to some very different strategies at those low Reynolds number versus high Reynolds number and a lot of uh, morphological differences across scale. Um, so we're going to focus a little bit on cilia as, uh, as our propulsor of choice today. Um, but when we think about cilia, we often think about microorganisms or cellular dynamics. Right here, we've got a paramecium kind of chugging along. Um, it's using its cilia to swim. Uh, but the largest animals that use cilia are actually tenophores, um, which they're their own phylum, phylum tenophora. Uh, and their cilia are much longer than your sort of typical cilia. Typical cilia are about um, 10 microns or less. Tenophore cilia are about a millimeter or thereabouts. Uh, and they actually are used in, in kind of these big bundled paddles called teens, uh, which starts with a C. So that's fun, C-T-E-N-E. -E. Um, but tenophores are the largest animals that use cilia to swim. Uh, and their cilia are the largest cilia that there are. Uh, and so as a fluid dynamicist, that's kind of a fun, interesting little red flag that pops up. What is this canonical low Reynolds number propulsor doing operating at a hundred times the scale that it should be, right? According to, to what we might assume. And so that really caught my attention and I wanted to probe it further. Um, and so that, that question of scale has really followed me through a lot of different areas. This next slide has a lot of videos on it, which is why it's taking so long to pop up. Um, but uh, my lab in general tries to park itself at this interface, at the interface between where inertia dominates and where viscosity dominates. Uh, so we do a lot of work on uh, animals. We have another project that we started fairly recently on insects uh, and insect locomotion. Um, which I don't have anything on this slide, uh, but we also look at uh, non-living things. We look at particles that are important in the environment. We've done some work on microplastics. Um, we look at kind of particles and flow and uh, how kind of the combination of inertia and viscosity, when those two forces are both important, how does that affect the transport? How does that affect locomotion, et cetera, et cetera. So if you wanna know a little bit more, you know, because 25 minutes is pretty short, um, you can go ahead and, and go to my lab pa web page there. Okay, so cilia. Cilia move fluid typically at low Reynolds numbers. Uh, and if you're operating at a low Reynolds number, you have to be spatially asymmetric, right? Um, if you windshield wipe with your time reversible flow, imagine your swimming pool full of molasses, there's no net movement of fluid if there's no glide, right? So if I go this way and then I stop and then I go this way, I've just moved all the molasses exactly back to where it was. Um, and so when you are operating at that low Reynolds number, you have to incorporate that spatial um, asymmetry. Um, and so what that really translates to is a difference in the cross-sectional area between the power and the recovery stroke. So here your cilium cartoon kind of hugs closer to the substrate uh, on, the, on the recovery stroke. So we're gonna call that spatial asymmetry. Um, there are other ways, there's a really nice, um, paper from Daisuke Takagi in uh, 2015 that shows you can break symmetry by introducing phase lag between your neighbors and still have a symmetric stroke that generates net flow. Uh, but we're gonna say, okay, spatial asymmetry, you need it. Um, and, and actually temporal asymmetry, so if your power stroke is faster than your recovery stroke, that doesn't actually help. So if I'm windshield wiping, but I'm going really fast on my power stroke and really slow on the recovery stroke, that doesn't, that doesn't actually help me move fluid, right? Um, and so, that spatial asymmetry is really what you need um, at those low Reynolds numbers. But if you start moving up in scale, right, where inertia starts coming into play, then your temporal asymmetry 
could help you. So we started to wonder sort of what's the relative role of spatial and temporal asymmetry. Um, so we talked a little bit about tenophores. Um, they're the largest animals that use cilia. Um, and there are a lot of different families of tenophores, a couple of different morphologies. Let's see if I can get this video to play. Maybe, no, this is a cool video. So I'm gonna try to get it to play it by itself. Come on, you. Okay, um, it's not gonna play. So I'll just describe it. Um, this, this little guy in the middle of the screen in, in kind of the golden color, he's about one centimeter um, in size. So it's, it's pretty big for, for a critter that you might imagine moving around the cilia, um, but those long tentacles that you see are sticky. Uh, and when they capture a prey, they can actually retract te the tentacles quite quickly. Uh, and then they kind of zoom off into the corner uh, to munch on their prey and kind of get it off the tentacle. So even with uh, just cilia, just cilia. Uh, they're, they're actually quite fast and maneuverable um, for what you might expect. Um, and so we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, so spatial versus temporal asymmetry. Um, we wanted to define this, uh, and this is what I'm presenting today is mostly the work of my former PhD student, Adrian Herrera-Maya, who's now a postdoc with Monica Wilhelmus at Brown and Dan Harris. Um, but so Adrian uh, kind of defined spatial asymmetry by saying, well, let's trace the tip of the team right? Uh, and the area that it traces out is related to how spatially asymmetric the stroke is. Uh, and, you know, in, in fluids, we love to normalize everything. We hate anything dimensional. We want everything to be nice and dimensionless. So we normalize this by what we call the practical, the practical reachable space of that teen tip, right? So it's flexible. The overall reachable space of that tip would be this purple half circle. But in, in a practical sense, we've inscribed an ellipse here. And this is arbitrary, but this is just our way of uh, accounting for spatial asymmetry. So we take the ratio of those two areas. Um, as it approaches zero, that's a maximally symmetric stroke. If it approaches one, that's a maximally asymmetric stroke. Okay, so zero to one, one is asymmetric, zero is symmetric. And we can look at uh, temporal asymmetry in the same way, right? We can take a look at the velocity of that tip of the teen which is a, like I said, a bundle of millimeter long cilia that's kind of in a, like a paintbrush paddle type uh, uh, configuration. But we can compare the duration of the power stroke uh, and the recovery stroke. So we can say if that approaches um, plus one, the power stroke is infinitely short and therefore infinitely fast. Okay, and then we're temporally asymmetric in that way. If it approaches minus one, then you have an infinitely fast um, recovery. Right, so slow power, fast recovery, fast power, slow recovery. So those are our two parameters we're working with, spatial asymmetry and temporal asymmetry. Um, and so what we did was um, we, we actually collected most of these data uh, at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. So tough life, you know, uh, went to Bermuda, uh, collected a bunch of uh, tenophores. This is um, Bolanopsis. Uh, which is a lobate tenophore, not the little round one with the tentacles, but a different kind of tenophore that filter feeds. Um, and uh, so we looked at um, the flow generated by the teens using particle shadow velocimetry. I think probably you have heard of particle image velocimetry. Come on, you. Cannot play video. I tested these before. I swear I did. Um, that's okay. I've got it still on the next slide. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through the setup in a second, um, but I do want to acknowledge collaborators. So our collaborator at BIOS was um, Amy Moss, and later we actually filled in the data set uh, from cultured animals at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, which has a crack team of gelatinous organism aquarists. So if you're ever looking for husbandry techniques for anything squishy and marine, these are the people you want to talk to. So uh, Mac, Wyatt, Tommy, uh, and then we also worked with David Murphy um, at the University of South Florida. Um, and then Ellie Sieber was a, an undergraduate with my lab who went along as a field assistant on this trip. Uh, so what we did was we, on here. yeah, so this is the setup. Um, we take a high-speed camera and a long working distance microscope objective. Um, we take the animal in this vessel, sometimes free swimming and sometimes pinned uh, to a silicone coated slide. Uh, and then we have a collimated backlight. Uh, and so what happens then is we seed the flow with tracer particles. In this case, we used single-celled algae um, to uh, avoid kind of 
bothering the animal if you use typical glass or plastic microspheres, they actually produce a lot of mucus uh, and then your tracers clump together and that's not good for flow visualization. Um, and so we took our, our teen fours um, and zoomed in on those teens and this is what they look like. And when you zoom in the, on the body wall, each teen of four has eight rows that sort of longitudinally um, circumscribe the body. Uh, so we zoom in on one of these rows and position the animal just so, so that the plane of focus of our objective is sort of cutting through the row. Um, and this is an interesting technique because you're, you're using the optics of the system itself to isolate the plane where you're doing the measurement. Um, so it's a little bit different than particle image velocimetry, which typically, if you're doing planar work, you're typically using um, a laser sheet to isolate that plane, uh, but it has a lot in common with microscale uh, particle image velocimetry. If for those of you that are familiar with that, I know we saw a little bit of it in the last talk, or um, at least a you know cousin techniques. Um, but so this kind of imaging allows us not only to track the tips of the teens, um, but also the um, flows generated by the teens themselves. I'm gonna relaunch this and see if it can make the videos work just to see if we can do that because sometimes that helps. No, okay. Um, so if you can imagine something like that, right? Uh, and we get those vector fields. Um, and lo and behold, what do we get from the kinematics, right? We can trace that tip. And that's all we need to calculate the spatial and temporal asymmetry. Uh, and just as the physics would dictate, um, we see that the spatial asymmetry matters more at those very low Reynolds numbers. And the temporal asymmetry matters more at those higher Reynolds numbers, right? So as we go from the viscous dominated to the inertially dominated regime, we see this increase in temporal asymmetry, right? Uh, and so that's kind of an interesting observation, but not terribly surprising. What we don't really know is, is how this is controlled or how it's triggered or how the animals are sensing, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm bigger now, right? Because for, for a lot of these organisms across ontogeny, right, the larvae look very similar to the adults, but they're much smaller. Um, so an animal that's about two millimeters in body size is going to have a very different flow regime to be working in than an animal that's five or seven centimeters. Right, uh, and so uh, it's kind of an interesting um, problem that I haven't yet solved on on how that kind of mechanistic um, behavior change is governed or sensed. Uh, so if anybody has thoughts on that, I'd really love to hear them. Um, but here are the flow fields that we get um, from this, uh, and it's it's kind of interesting here because you can see sometimes we get a flow field that's kind of consistent. You can see this kind of layer of fluid. This animal is beating. Uh, so that it's moving fluid down. Uh, but here you can see a couple of distinct kind of vortex patterns. Um, and there's not a big difference in Reynolds numbers. You know, this one is slightly higher, right? Uh, but the temporal and spatial asymmetries are not terribly off. Uh, so, so we really kind of had more questions then about what, what is really governing the character of the flow field that's developing. You know, in both cases, they're generating flow um, across and, and down, as you would expect if you're trying to generate thrust to move. Um, but there's, there's a little bit of a difference here between the radially generated flow and the tangentially generated flow. So there's um, a little bit more radial flow in the second case, which is this kind of straighter uh, body wall curvature, right? You can see those vortices developing and it, and it maps to a slightly higher um, radial flow. So you're pushing more flow out um, in the case on the right. Um, and of course, with uh, if anybody's ever done, you know, animal behavior work, right? It's it's really hard to get them to do what you want them to do, uh, and you have small sample sizes, and you're re restricted to kind of what you can observe. Uh, you can't kind of turn the knob and systematically vary the parameters that you want to vary. You know, you can't be like, hey, you know, please be exactly 25 hertz. Can't do that. Uh, and so we partnered with um, some computational collaborators over at Villanova, although um, if any of you know Cheng Yu Li, fantastic uh, computational fluid uh, dynamicist, uh, his lab is in the process of moving over to Case Western. Um, and so uh, if you want to talk to Cheng Yu, uh, he's a fantastic collaborator, especially for merge boundary methods with membranous biological surfaces. Um, so Cheng Yu and his group took the experimental data, the videos that we sent them, and sort of extracted the beating patterns um, of the tenophores uh, and put them into their model. And once they did that, 
they could do all kinds of fun stuff. For example, they could change the rental supper where, where we really can't uh, do that with the animals. Um, and uh, another thing they wanted to be able to do was to take out some of the teens to sort of artificially make that row of teens uh, sparser, right? Um, and so uh, teen fours use metachronal locomotion like a lot of other organisms in, uh, in the marine environment. You can see it in things like shrimp, and krill, uh, even polychaete and uh, tomopterid worms are a great example uh, that you have um, this sort of sequential beating of, uh, of propulsors down a row or a carpet, um, just like you would see in small scale cilia. Uh, but in tenophores, it's, it's just a this kind of two dimensional row, one dimensional row, two dimensional propulsor. Um, and so we found something really interesting, uh, which was when you take out the propulsors, something happens to the vortex development in the fluid right above them. Uh, and it, in retrospect, it's actually quite easy to understand the flexibility of the propulsors and the way that they shape the power and recovery stroke. You can kind of see it here. During the power stroke, the tips of the propulsors are much further apart. And during the recovery stroke, they're much closer together. And when you have a propulsor that's waving back and forth like that, if you're at a high enough frontal number, typically you're going to generate a vortex on the power stroke and a vortex on the recovery stroke. But because of the flexibility and the spacing, the vortex that's generated on the power stroke can grow more than the vortex that's generated on the recovery stroke. Uh, and this right here, these red vortices are the ones generated on the power strokes. Those are the ones that are contributing to thrust. And these are the ones that are contributing to drag, right? So when you're generating flow, right, this is the, the direction that actually is pushing you in the way you wanna go. And you kind of want to minimize any flow disturbance as you come back, right? And so what we found was that the spacing of the propulsors is, is related to this vortex weakening, um, is what uh, Cheng Yu decided to call it. When you have a power stroke, those vortices can grow. But when you have a recovery stroke, they're so close together that they sort of interfere with each other uh, and they can't really grow. And you can see this when we take out every other teen and we give that recovery vortex a chance to grow, it, it decreases the overall thrust that's being generated. Um, and so the average thrust coefficient decreases when you artificially um, manipulate the spacing between the propulsors. Um, and so um, you can see it here um, and where we, we look actually over one cycle, right? Uh, and then we look at the thrust coefficient for each teen. Um, and I, I can refer you guys to the paper for more details can, since I'm kind of almost out of time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon and one that we think has applications to all of these other metachronally coordinated systems out there and potentially having uh, applications to things like violence by robotics and things like that, which I will hopefully have time to talk about in just a second. Um, and the most interesting thing, uh, which I think is fascinating, um, is that this mechanism doesn't work very well as the Reynolds number increases, right? Because as you increase your Reynolds number, your, your vortices kind of fly off into space, right? They get shed. Right now we're at this kind of sweet spot where the vortex remains attached to the propulsor. So as we increase the Reynolds number, this mechanism is, is, is less effective. But what's really interesting um, is that the spacing of these propulsors is not constant across different families of tenophores. Um, and so I think, again, these videos are not gonna work either, but you can still see in uh, this family, Baroe, um, versus this family, Pleurobrachia. Pleurobrachia has comparatively shorter teens that are further apart, and Baroe has comparatively longer teens that are closer together. Uh, and, and the Baroe teens beat at higher frequencies than the Pleurobrachia teens. So you can see that relationship between spacing is, probably highly dependent on Reynolds numbers. So if you want to beat at higher Reynolds numbers, you have to get closer together. Uh, and so my, my PhD student, um, Reza, is working on this problem right now. Uh, and so we hope to have more to tell you uh, in a little bit on that and see if that's borne out by what we observe in the biological world. OK, so um, again, I'm really, I'm really sad about this. And I don't know what happened. Something with codex. It's always codex. Um, but uh, so I'll just describe these videos. Um, one other thing we noticed was that tenophores are extremely maneuverable. 
um, which is uh, kind of interesting given that we don't usually think of ciliates, ciliates as being, you know, zippy, right? Um, but these guys kind of are, um, and we can, we can actually measure the behavior of freely swimming animals in 3D. We can use markerless tracking, uh, thanks to some really nice innovations by Ty Hedrick and his group and the software they've developed. They've been able to incorporate some deep learning stuff into the latest versions of their software. Uh, so check that out if you haven't. Um, but uh, we can actually track the, the uh, organs of the teen horse um, and, uh, and say, okay, we can see when they're going forward, we can see when they're going backward, and we can see when they're turning. Uh, and so we looked at the average difference between the forward and backward swimming speed, and we found that they can swim just as fast forward as they can backwards, which is not true of most uh, things that swim. Uh, and so that was kind of an interesting thing. And we also found that they can turn without too much of a reduction in their body speed. And you think about your car, right? When you take a sharp turn, you have to slow way down. Uh, but, but these guys can take really, really sharp turns, uh, even uh, at maybe a quarter body length per second, uh, which is not amazingly fast, but it's still, you know, they're not slowing to a stop uh, when they do these very, very sharp turns. Um, so we did some math modeling and I'll, for the sake of time, I'll skip over the details. Did some math modeling, this was during COVID because we couldn't be in the lab, so we did some math. <laughs> um, but effectively what we did was we modeled each uh, teen as an oscillating flat plate to capture that spatial asymmetry. Uh, and then we sort of dephased them and said, okay, well, we're gonna say this is a, this is a metaclonal um, row of propulsors. We don't have the flexibility, of course, you don't have the fluid structure interaction, and we don't even have any hydrogen interactions between plates, but it worked okay, right? We validated it against the, the data that we had, uh, and we said, okay, we can capture roughly the speeds uh, and accelerations that we observe in the animals, uh, and we can extend this, and there's my caveats, right? We don't, we don't have a lot of, um, we have, there's a lot of stuff we don't capture, but we can put it in um, a uh, three-dimensional context, right? And we can control the frequency differential in turning. So we can explore different ways that the animals turn, right? So, uh, and, and from our observations, there are several ways that they do this. Sometimes they just turn off all the rows, uh, but to um, the organ that controls the frequency that's sent to each teen row is actually paired so they don't have eight independent frequencies they can send, they only have four. Uh, and so if you wanna talk about the biology, we can do that. Um, but uh, effectively we can say, well, we're gonna set two rows to turn on the outer side at a fast frequency. We're gonna get two to at a, at a lower frequency and we're gonna get a sharp turn. Or we're gonna get them all to go. And then we're gonna have the two on the outer side beat a little bit faster. We're gonna get a, a, a wide turn and we're gonna explore the possible turning space that we can access. Um, with this different combination of frequencies. Um, and so what we did was um, we took a concept from um, Malcolm Kyra at Northwestern uh, and, and looked at the reachable space or the motor volume um, of a tenophore. Um, and what you do is you just say, okay, well, what's over a certain time horizon, where can I go, right? Over three seconds, you know, I can, go forward, I can turn or I can go backward. Uh, you know, for a human being, right, our motor volume would be 2D, right? Because we can't go up and down, right? There are some animals that can't really move sideways. And so their motor volume would kind of be quite hourglassy. Uh, and what we found is for our modeled tenophores, um, they have this sort of omnidirectional motor volume, uh, which is very interesting, right? They can effectively access any space, right? They can turn on a dime and they can move to any space. And when we looked at our real tenophores, that's the top row here, um, our, our motor volume is kind of elongated in the X direction because our, our sample consisted only of animals that swam through our volume. So we're only looking at animals that had a non-zero forward speed as they entered our field of view, which is why it's kind of stretched in this X direction. But if you look at the other two coordinate dimensions, it's pretty equal, right? Uh, and so of all of our observations of turning sequences, and we can see, okay, they, they go everywhere, right? They go backward, they go forward, they turn sharply, they turn broadly. Uh, and so that kind of uh, tips us off to um, possible applications. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer, right? I'm constantly thinking, well, how can I, how can I build something cool out of this? Um, and because I am already out of time, uh, I wanna move to that really quickly and just show you some fun stuff. Um, so this is uh, our, latest foray into how do we get animals to do what we want, we can't, so let's build something that we can get to do what we want. 
Uh, and so my postdoc, uh, David Peterman, whose picture is somewhere, um, he, uh, he's built this sort of soft robotic magnetoactive elastomer platform. Um, and uh, it's basically these artificial teens that are uh, pulled uh, with an electromagnet. And then we have a little treadmill of magnets that runs around under them. Uh, and so we can control then the, the frequency and the phase lag. And, and then we can actually do a more traditional PID setup here with a laser plane coming in from the side uh, and a high-speed camera coming in here. So we can look at the flow that is generated. And so that's what that looks like. And th that's not an animal, right? That's an artificial robotic platform. Um, these, because of uh, sort of methodological constraints, these guys are a little bit longer. They're about four millimeters long instead of one millimeter, but we can manipulate the fluid. So we do these experiments in glycerol uh, or a mixture of water and glycerol so that we can dynamically scale the Reynolds number to match the biological system. And then we can do fun things like manipulate the curvature of the substrate and see how that affects uh, the flows that are generated. Right, um, and that just kind of requires a little tweaking of our of our experimental setup. Um, and then we can also, this is very recent, so this slide is a little bit messy, um, but uh, we can change the spatial asymmetry um, by by changing the polling of the uh, elastomers. So we cast the propulsors in a curved shape, and then we sort of pull them under elastic strain, so that the magnetic domains that we encode in those propulsors. Uh, end up kind of getting wonkily curved back. And so we can look at uh, different shape propulsors uh, and the curvature there. And I don't have too much time to talk about that. And that's we really just kind of embarked on that very recently. So I don't have too many results to share, but we, we can say that the curvature encoding uh, with the magnets kind of affect the spatial asymmetry and the temporal asymmetry uh, and also the overall momentum generation. So our curved propulsors, the teal here uh, and the sort of dark blue are generating much more momentum net uh, that are just back and forth windshield wiper ones. Yeah, um, and so uh, we can look at increasing Reynolds number and what that does. We can look at differences across flat versus curved substrates. We can look at uh, differences in phase lag here. So, um, and we really, and I know this is a lot to get through and, and I don't really wanna go into any detail. I just wanna show you the, the parameter space that we can explore with uh, a robotic physical model uh, is, is much, easier to control than uh, a biological behaving animal that may or may not be having a good day. Um, and so we can see that as we increase the Reynolds number, this mechanism stops being so efficient, right? It starts, it starts directing flow away from the substrate, but that may be what you want uh, in certain contexts. We've thought about uh, pumping applications where you might wanna control, okay, right now I want flow across, that's very smooth. And right now I want mixing across the channel right, uh, and applications like that. So this is actually maybe not a bug, but a feature. Um, and we have uh, some preliminary data showing that all, all of these variables can uh, change the generated flow profile. Um, and so uh, that's just kind of like a teaser. Uh, we're, we're working on more and more of these sort of bio-robotic models and that help us to explore this very large parameter space a little bit more effectively. Uh, and uh, so stay tuned for more results from those platforms. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you very much.